I am excited about the Lord today. I love Him. I'm so excited about His presence. I want more of it. And I'm so excited about His Word. I need more of it. So John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. Say life. Life. In him was life. Say life. Life. In him was life. Say life. life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. In in John 1, 14 It says, and the word became flesh. The word became flesh. The word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. I shared this morning, and I want to share it with us again today, that there's many times in our lives as Christians where we feel unfulfilled, where we feel like we haven't been made complete, where we feel like that dynamic change that we're looking for has yet to happen. Can I get a witness? Sometimes we feel like we have, we come to a Sunday service, we get ignited, and we feel there's hope where there wasn't hope before, and we're excited about that hope, and we leave the building, yet to find out that on Wednesday, life pulls the life out of us. Am I the only one that that happens to? No. So I want to share with you something that I hope adjusts our perspective. Because I think if our perspective can be adjusted in what I'm going to talk about today, our life will be changed for time and eternity. Our life will be changed on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on Sunday when we hear the word again. Our lives will have consistent change, consistent development, and we will have dynamic consistent, sustained change and victory instead of little spurts that we hang on to for the next three or four months. Can I talk real this morning? Can I talk real about where real life is this morning? Because I myself need to understand this and the church body, we together need to understand the concept that I'm going to talk about today. Because real life change doesn't happen through an introduction. When I met Linda at that youth group meeting at Patty Berger and Tom Berger's house, and she thought I was cute but obnoxious, <laughs> and she was right, not on the cute part, on the obnoxious part, and she thought I was cute and she thought I was obnoxious, that was an introduction, was it not? So that introduction was a meeting that helped us to have maybe an expectation that went in the back of our minds till years later. But that introduction didn't give sustained true life change. That introduction didn't impact people around us in a great way. But what does impact us for true life change is life covenant and life commitment. Because through a life covenant and a life commitment, through sustained, vulnerable relationship with each other, what happens? Well, not too far down the road, there's a house, there's four little kids, then those four kids grow up, then there's another house, and then there's another house, and then there's ministry, and then there's lives, and there's youth ministry, and then there's children's ministry, and then there's um, worship ministry, and there's now lives that are changed because a relationship went beyond an introduction into a covenant of life togetherness. Well, what I want to share with you today is the way that we look at this book is the difference between whether we will get spurts of dynamic change or a lifetime of productive, fruitful relationship that will change us so deep on the inside 
over periods of time, over seasons in our lives that will affect so many people and help you walk in victory. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But as always, there's a price to pay. I wrote, we get discouraged in our walk, not experiencing the dynamic change we desire, or we only have spurts of change without sustained growth, development, or breakthrough. True change that we desire takes place with something that's more than an introduction. It takes relationship and vulnerability. The effectiveness of this change is in direct correlation as how we see and embrace our relationship with the Word of God. Say relationship with the Word. I guess what we have to determine today, is this book just a best-selling, all-time best-selling book? Because it is. Best-selling book of all time is right here. Is this book just a book that provides us the history of Israel, the prophets, Genesis, the beginning of time? Is it just a book that gets us to understand that Jesus came to the earth and walked and there's some principles and there's letters that Paul wrote. Is it just a book to give us science? Because there's science in this book. Is it just a book that gives us uh, facts on biblical information so that we can do really good on Bible survey? We have to decide what this book is. We have to decide how we approach this book, because if we look at this book as the, just the bestseller of all time, we can lead it, read it as literature, and we can read it and get intellectual on the facts and the, and, the, and the information that's in here. So it depends on how we actually look at this book. And I want to challenge our thought process for a moment, and I know for a second your head's going to turn sideways because it sounds a little weird, but listen to me for a second. The Father did not send a book to come to the world. The Father did not send a book to walk among us on the world, in the world. The Father didn't send a book that would walk among us and then heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, preach the kingdom. He didn't send a book that would suffer and die, that would carry a cross to Golgotha. He didn't send a book to be nailed to a cross. He didn't send a book to die to be put into the grave and on the third day rise again and then be seated at the right hand of the Father. He didn't send a book that would be visited by men walking on the earth after his resurrection at some points being visited by 500 people, seeing 500 people at the same time. He didn't send a book to forever sit at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you and to make intercession for me. He didn't send a book to do that. He sent his best to do that. He sent his son to do that. He sent the word to do that. In the beginning, we read these verses sometimes. In the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God, and we beheld it, we beheld the book, we beheld him, we beheld him, and I think what has happened often, and I'm just being pastoral and just sharing my heart with you, I think what happens in churches all over America is people get an initial in introduction to Jesus, and you can't meet Jesus and not be changed and impacted if you really meet him, your sins are forgiven, you know you're going to heaven, amen? Amen. And that happens, but what happens is after a while, if we don't continue in that relationship, the fruitfulness and the byproduct of good, healthy relationship is not there. And so therefore, we come to church on a Sunday, and I'm not talking down to anybody, I'm preaching to myself, I love you, and I know God loves us, so he wants us to kind of sometimes adjust things, but what happens is we go from Sunday to Sunday getting somebody else's information and somebody else's excitement about spending time with God, the Word, and now we're giving you that information, and what happens on the inside of your heart? Hopefully. <laughs> You're challenged, you're changed, it's exciting. It gives you a breath of hope. It gives you something to look at, but it doesn't change your life. It gives you hope that there's opportunity for your life to be changed. True life change happens through relationship. The Father didn't send a book. He sent his best 
Jesus the Word. Amen. 1 John 5, 7. I think I quoted it wrong in the first, seven, first service. I think I said 1 John 4, 7. It is 1 John 5, 7, right? Put it up there. Let's see if I got it right. Yeah. For there are three that bear record in heaven. There's three things that count in heaven. There's three things that have authority in heaven, and they're not things. They're people. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. God the Father, God the Son, which is the Word and the Holy Ghost. There's three that bear record in heaven. There's three that are seen. There's three that are recorded in heaven. There's three that have authority in heaven. And one of them is, it's interesting that he doesn't say Jesus. He calls him the Word. The Word was made flesh and the Word dwelled among us. Cultivate, develop, and maintain. Say this with me. Cultivate, Cultivate. maintain, and develop a relationship with Jesus is, in fact, cultivating, developing, and maintaining a relationship with the Word of God. And if you hang with Him, and I hang with Him, the Word of God, there will be true life change on the inside. How many would say, I'm really looking for true life change? Nobody is. That's, I'll see you later. I'm in the wrong church. How many really want true life change? Are you, you're totally satisfied with your financial status? You're totally sa satisfied with your marital status? Are you totally satisfied with your emotional health? <laughs> you're like, whoa. He's talking about the Bible like this is heresy. No, I'm trying to reshape us. Stay with me. To how we approach the words in this book. Because if we see it only as a book of literature, or it's the Word of God, but you know what? It's difficult for me to dig into this. How many of you ever felt that? When you do that, you're, you're going toward religion and not relationship. And if you could see this book as the living Word of God, if you could see this book as the second person in the Trinity his words coming off the page, the words that the Father gave him to bear record on earth with, that will change your relationship with this book. And when it changes the relationship with this book, it'll change your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we are very good at eating physical food, at least I am. But we don't understand at times if we are not feeding our spirit man. And the thing that feeds our spirit man is the word of God. The thing that makes the, word, the, the spirit man grow, make him healthy, make him develop, make him excited, make him have fire, make him have passion again for Jesus is feeding him the word. And the reason this is so difficult for us to hear today in first and second service, how do you say this in a kind <laughs> way where people aren't hurt? Are you convinced that I love you? 90% are not. <laughs> I really, really love you. I really, really love you. And that's why we've given our lives. And what I want to say to you is probably 10% of the Church of America open their Bible during the week. 10%. And we're struggling. We're struggling in our conduct. We're struggling with addiction, we're struggling with sexual habits, we're struggling with anger and rage, we're struggling, we're struggling, we're struggling in our marriages, we're struggling, and we're coming to church and we're putting all kinds of pressure on the spiritual heroes that stand up here on the platform and say, fix me doctor, help me, make something change, I need some help, and let me tell you something, it doesn't work because we don't got that junk for you. We're just men and women that love God like you do. But the difference is, is that we keep feeding on the word. We keep feeding on the word. So what I want to tell you is please, please, please don't allow yourself to be deceived. Because if you put all this pressure on us and look at us as though we are some superhuman beings, like Marvel's characters, which we're not, you're going to be disappointed. Because I'm going to say something, we're going to say something that you don't like. We're going to do something that you don't like. But Jesus, he has yet to fail me yet. Jesus has yet to let me down. Jesus has yet to give me wrong advice. Jesus has yet to not love me when I'm unlovable, even when I'm grouchy. 
but none of you were ever grouchy. Do you know that Pastor D gets grouchy sometimes? I do. So when I get grouchy, just stay away from me and get in the Bible. Because <laughs> you know what? It'll set you up for a big fall if you put that on us. Because we don't have the goods. We don't. Because God the Father didn't send us to die on that cross for you. Is this all right? A little culture shock in your brain? All right, but it's okay. It's okay. Three things. The Word is a person. The Word is alive. And the Word is healing medicine. Can I talk about those? Just three? And the Word is so much more than that. Putting this in here that's not in my notes, I mentioned in first service. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, 165 says, great peace. Say this with me, great peace. Have they that love your word. Great peace. Have they that love your word. And nothing. Look at your neighbor, say nothing. Shall offend them. Why is that unique? Why is that powerful? And why is that important? Because we have so much in the body of Christ of disappointment. We have so much offense in the body of Christ. We have offense with our brother and our sister, our husband, our wife. We have so much offense and we want to come and talk about it. Here's my experience. We want to come and talk about it. It could be a married couple. It could be two individuals. It could be a family. They want to come in. They want to talk about it. And nine times out of ten what I've learned is everybody and every individual in the room wants to prove to me that they're right and their spouse or their family's wrong. You said I could be real. I'm just being real. And we're, we're coming in because we want to prove our point and we want the pastor to correct our wife. Or we want the pastor to correct our husband. And it goes on for three hours and we do these meetings, you know, okay, let's meet next month at the same time. We come back and it's the same exact thing. I mean, you want, <laughs> you want to twist our heads? Just keep doing that. But the thing is, here's the thing. Great peace. I'm not, well, let me just say this. I'm not saying I don't want to counsel anybody. That's not what I'm saying. We counsel every day, all day, phones open, we do it. But what I'm saying to you is to expect something to change for you when you're not having a deep relationship with the Word. What has to change, here, listen to me, church, your circumstance and the people around you and the life around you will never change until you do. You have to be changed from the inside out and your world around you will change. That's how this thing works. And that's why it says great peace. Smile at me, please. You're looking so mad today. Great peace. Have they that love thy, thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Because you know what? When you've got a great relationship with the word, you have joy. When you have a great relationship with the word, you have hope in hopeless situations. When you have a relationship with the word, you know that even though you're unlovable and you're grouchy at times, God loves you so deeply, it really doesn't matter if someone doesn't like you. It doesn't. It doesn't matter if people reject you. It doesn't. When you're so in love with the word who is Jesus Christ and you have such a relationship with, with him, that relationship is so satisfying. I remember the day I got saved, I was like drunk for a year. I'm serious. At 15 years of age, I got saved. I met him. I was drunk in love for a year. I mean, I was literally high, and I feel bad because a lot of people say to me, well, that wasn't my experience. Well, I'm sorry it wasn't. I wish it was. I don't understand why mine was, but I was literally drunk for a year. I wouldn't care if you stole my car. I wouldn't care if you stole my girlfriend. I wouldn't care if you took my money. I really didn't care because I met the answer to all my prayers. I met the answer to all my needs. I met the one who loved me so deeply when I was so wounded and so hurt and so rejected and so abused. Oh, I feel better now. That's better. I'm going home now. I'm good. I'm, I'm better. That's who I met. And I urge you and I beg you, don't do the religion thing, please. 
Because at the end of that road, you'll get to heaven because you've accepted Christ. But man, you're going to be so tortured in your life, in your mind, and your... He is the answer. Think about it. The God of the universe is cool enough to want to hang with you. <laughs> everything that's seen, everything that's not seen, everything that's made was made through Jesus, through the word, and yet he's saying, I want to have fellowship. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. That talks about life union. If I have a life union with the person of the word, I can even ask what I will and it will be given for me, given to me. The problem is, is that our culture in today's society has taught us that if it doesn't happen instantly, it's probably not going to happen. But God's timetable is not our timetable. I'll never forget driving home two weeks right before my dad passed. I'll never forget this. Linda and I went down there, just the two of us, and got him those Ralph's pizzas that he loves so much from Nutley. Brought them in his house, and he was like, give me those pies. Brought them inside. We had the pizza pie, and he told me about his vision of heaven and mind blown and mind totally shot. And listen, here's the problem. We're offended so deeply that we don't spend enough time. We don't lay in the word and lay uh, in, in union with Christ and Jesus, the word, for him to take the stuff out of us so we're not so easily offended by the people that have hurt us. And we lose and miss out on supernatural miracles that will blow your mind and will cause others to come to Christ. For example, we drove home that day. Some of you know the story of my dad, some of you don't, but we're driving home back from Nutley that day, and we're in the car, and I hear the Lord say to me, and again, just to go on record, God doesn't speak to me every 33 seconds, but there are times when he speaks to me, and I know it. I said, I wish you'd speak to me more often, but this one was really clear, and it was like, you thought I forgot, but I never forgot, I remembered. I didn't even know what God was talking about, Deb. I had no idea what he meant. That's why you know it's God, because... You're not even thinking of these things. And he said, don't you remember when you were just saved, 16 years old, and you'd go up in your father's mother's room and you'd pray and you'd cry because my father was the hardest man I have ever known, the only man I ever feared. You understand what I'm saying? This was the most difficult guy, and I knew that he would not just get saved because someone told him because he was the most skeptical man on the face of the earth. He didn't believe anybody. Everybody had an angle. He grew up in the streets of Newark. He was messing around with gangsters, want to be a little gangster there. He grew up in life and he worked in Manhattan and he, d he dealt with people in Manhattan. He didn't trust anybody. Everybody had a gimmick. When I was going to the church in Nutley, he wanted to know what's going on with the money. I was like, I don't know. I'm 15. What do I know about the money? <laughs> Joe, he tortured me. <laughs> he tortured me. But I love my dad. So I prayed. When I got saved, before I got saved, at 12 years old, left in a puddle of my own blood after he gave me a beating, I came conscious hours later, and inside with a smile on my face but a rage inside, I said, I will take him out. I'm going to kill him. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lift weights, and when I get big enough pipe on the back of the head, I am taking him out. That's where I lived from 12 to 16 till I got saved or 15 but when I got saved, I instantly was released of anger and hatred. I really mean this. I love, that's what my introduction was. <laughs> he pulled all that out of me. But then I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I said, go, go, go back to my dad and mom's room now upstairs. I'd go into their room and I would pray and I would cry out to God as a young guy. And you know what, young people, you need to cry out to God a little more. Stop it now. Just stop with the surfacy religion, hoping mommy and daddy get you there. Go deeper. Because the God that we serve is so cool that he's going to help you in your generation to see things that you've never seen before if you'll spend the time to go after him. But so I'm on my knees and I'm crying. I'm saying, God, he takes me back there. This is 40 years earlier. I'm crying and I'm saying, God, save my father. He's the hardest man I have ever met. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I used to say this over and over. If you have to give him a glimpse of heaven... 
If you have to give him a vision of heaven, and I, Deb, I wanted it to happen that night. I wanted it to happen that night so this tough dude would fall to his face and say, oh my God, this Jesus is real. But it didn't happen. And it didn't happen until 40 years later. Somebody say 40 years. God is not on your timetable or on my timetable. He is faithful to do what we've asked him to do. If he's promised it, he'll bring it to pass. The problem is we've quit too early, too short-term vision, and we've lost out on many miracles that we would have seen that will bring people to Christ and change the world that we live in. That's the problem. It's not on Jesus' side. I feel a lot better now. But no, I'm serious. We didn't get into this to come to church on Sunday morning. Come on. I wouldn't be here. I'll tell you right now. I wouldn't wouldn't have chose being a pastor. That's not what my vision of life was. I wouldn't have chose. I wanted to play pro football. I wanted to do all kinds of things. That's what I wanted to do. But God changed it all. So if it wasn't real, I would not be here. If it wasn't real, Mike Rosa Sr. wouldn't say to me, uh... I saw something. I saw something. I think I see something. <laughs> it's real. Heaven is real. It's just, it's just right across, just another dimension. It's right here. Heaven's real. Christ is real. So the Lord said to me in the car two weeks before Pop died, I didn't forget. You thought I forgot. I remembered. I answered your prayer. I can't tell you what that did again for my love for Jesus. It took me to another place. And that's that's what I'm trying to say to you in relationship. When when you do stuff for your spouse, she does stuff for you. You think about them. They think about you. What does it do for your relationship? There's another level of warmth, love, respect, and want to cover and protect and want to. It's just. That's what it's supposed to be like with the Word. It's not a book. It is a book, but it's not just a book. It's the Word of God. It's the person of God. It's, it's Him manifesting Himself and bearing record to truth. And I'll do this quickly. What time is it now? Oh, it's, good. it's early. I have at least two hours. <laughs> no, we're going to do this quickly. If you're open to it, John... 1, 14 again. And the word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, the word, is alive, and he is full. What is he filled with? Grace and truth. So when you hang out with him and you touch him, what comes out of him? What do we need? How many need grace today? How many need truth today? Okay. We all need grace because we've all blown it. And we all need truth because truth gets us back in the directions we need to be going. He's very much alive. He's filled with grace and truth. And the cool thing is, through Jeremiah, a couple of verses here, the word is a person, but the word is also alive in Hebrews 4.12. I'm sorry. For the word of God is living and powerful. The word of God. The word of God. If you lay this on your bed at night, I remember my youth pastor saying this, Pastor Peter, when we were kids, he used to preach his heart out to us. And he said, when you go to bed at night and you throw this book next to your bed, if you peek over in the middle of the night, you're going to see that it's breathing. And I don't know about him, but that scared me to death. I was afraid to look over at night. (laughs) It's alive. It's quick, alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. You know why you know it's alive? Because look at what it says. A book can't do this. What does it say? Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit. But I like this. Joints and the marrows. And is a what? discerner of the thoughts and the intents of hearts, the th- the, a discerner of the thoughts. An inanimate object can't discern your thoughts. An inanimate object can't figure out what you're thinking or what your intentions are, but the reality of the person of the word does. When you read it, the intents of your heart are exposed. He's speaking to you. Has anyone ever experienced that? Yeah, of course. 
with Jeremiah 15, 16, there's some production in our lives. Just a few of these things. There's so many of them. But Jeremiah 15, 16 says, your words were found and I ate them. That's interesting. Your word was found and I ate your words. And your words became to me a joy and delight of my heart. For I'm called by your name. What happened here is, and what we need to understand is, when we eat the word, he said, because I'm called by your name, Jeremiah said. Now, Jeremiah was a man that went through very difficult times. This is the man that's called the weeping prophet. This is the man that's talking about the, the exile that the, Israel, the Israelites people were going to go into for hundreds of years of captivity. He didn't have a great ministry. He had a ministry to tell people basically we're going into captivity. And when they went, he was the weeping prophet. But yet he's saying that when I found your word in the midst of my life, anyone ever go through weeping? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning because Jesus' words, they bring joy. So Jeremiah is saying, I saw your word, I ate your word, and when I digested your word, it became the joy and the rejoicing of my soul. Read on, because you call me by your name. So what he was saying is the fact that everything is breaking loose around me, I can still have joy because I'm not offended, hurt, scared, anxious, filled with everything going around me because you're calling me by your name. You own me. I, I belong to you. Wow, the God of the universe says I belong to him. It became the joy and the rejoicing of his soul. Jeremiah 29, the word produces a fire. Jeremiah, then said I, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in me or in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. His word made me open my mouth. So even when he was going through his time and he says, I'm not going to speak your word anymore. You know why he was doing that? He was saying that because nobody was listening. And churches in America, there's 1,500 pastors a month quitting because people aren't listening. 15, say 1,500. That's a lot of churches in America where pastors are quitting. Because people aren't listening. But Jeremiah, as he preached his message his whole life and people wouldn't listen, he found his joy in eating the word. And then even when he was done and he said, I'm not going to open my mouth anymore. I know you want me to. I know that's my assignment, but I'm not going to do it anymore. The fact that he had hid the word of God and fed on the word of God, the person of the word on his, in his heart, it became a fire on the inside. And it caused him that he, where, where he couldn't even keep silent anymore. He had to preach. He had to speak. He had to say the word. Whether people listened or not, he was going to do it because it was on the inside of him. It also produces resurrected life. Job 14, 7 to 9 says, For there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its roots grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil. Wow. Roots grow old Stump dies in the soil, yet at the touch of water, it will bud again, and its branches will come forth with young plants. Have you ever seen, we talked about this earlier, have you ever seen a stump dead? I and mean, we've all had them on our properties, or we've seen them walking through a park. It's a stump that's cut down. It's dry. In some cases, you could see it's crackling and breaking on the top. It looks dead. But the great thing about the Word of God is it has resurrection power on the inside of it. Because Jesus is resurrected. And he says here, Job, even though everything looks hopeless and even the root system in the ground is dry and it looks dead, 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 gone at the very touch of water, all of a sudden a green little stem comes out and now where there was death and where there was no possibility of life, there was hope for a tree because the word of God touched it. And you might have issues in your life where it looks hopeless and looks dead. There's no hope at all for you. There's no life coming at all. You want to just take the shovel, throw the dirt on the thing, and bury it. But clearly, clearly, Jesus the Word has resurrection power to lift your dead situation and turn it all around. 
the word also has the ability to produce hearts that are burning with revelation that opens your eyes. Revelation that the two men on the road to Emmaus, don't have time to turn to it, but the two men on the road to Emmaus, um, Luke 24, 32, if you want to study that out, the whole chapter, it's right after the, rest, the death and the burial of Christ and his resurrection, and there's two of the disciples walking on a road to Emmaus. And they're talking about the things that happened, and Jesus just shows up on the scene. It's so cool. Say they were disciples, so you think they would have known Jesus, right? So they're wa- he just shows up on the scene. He comes out of nowhere and is walking with them. By the way, this Jesus that we serve, when he, re- when he was risen from the grave, he showed himself to over 500 people at a time. Amazing. It's real. It happened. So he's walking with them, and he's, well, what's going on, guys? Well, we're talking about the things that have just happened in Jerusalem. Well, what things? They're like, are you from Mars? You, don't, you didn't hear about this Jesus who turned the world upside down and now he's dead? You didn't hear about this? So Jesus continues to walk with them. The story goes on and he starts to open up the scriptures to them. He starts talking about the word of God and he's talking about who he was in the prophets and what the prophets described. And as, they, as later on he's gone, he disappears and they say in, in their hearts, Did not our hearts burn when he opened the word to us? That's relationship. Our hearts can burn with new revelation when we spend time in the word. I understand that this is not a popular, fun word to hear today. But it is probably the most important thing you'll hear. Because if you can develop a relationship with the word, your life will change forever. Thank you, God. The word is a healing medicine. We'll end with these two verses. Jeremiah 8, 22. Jeremiah is crying out right before verse 22. And he's saying, the summer is gone. The harvest is is past. But why then is the daughters of my people? In other words, why is the church not healed it's we've been past the seasons we've gone through seasons we've heard the word we've been in church why are people not healed why are people still struggling emotionally physically why 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 have we not accepted that and then he gives an answer a rhetorical question actually he says is there no bomb in gilead is there no physician there why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered And now what he did here is he used an analogy that they would clearly understand. In the region of Gilead, there were certain large trees. And these trees, you've probably heard this before, these trees would produce a sap and they would tap into the bark of these trees and they would collect the sap or the syrup out of these trees. And that syrup or sap was used and known to have medicinal qualities. It was used for health and recovery. And so because they understood that, he was preaching to all of Israel and saying, if there is no, isn't there no bomb in Gilead? Of course they knew there was a bomb in Gilead. And then he goes on to say, is there no doctor? Is there no physician in Gilead? Of course there is. So what I say to the church today and the church in America, is there no bomb in America? Is there no bomb? Is there no physician for the church of Jesus Christ? That's a rhetorical question. Of course he's the great physician. Of course he is the bomb of Gilead. He sent his word to heal them. But the problem is we can't and Jesus can't and the platform can't force feed anybody any kind of bomb. We can't hold the spoon, pour the syrup and say, come on now, honey, eat the syrup. We can't do that. And we've been tricked in America to think that if I just come on Sunday or maybe come twice a month or three times a month, that all the cure that I need will be, made, will be manifest to me. And that's just not true. All that happens on a Sunday morning is somebody has gotten a word from, from God that's caused fire on the... Can you tell I'm a little fired up today? 
Well, I got fired up because I spent time with the Word, and it got inside of me a fire that I couldn't shut my mouth. And whether people hear it or forbear it or reject it, I've got to share it because it's a Word that's put a fire inside of me. And maybe that fire will ignite some kind of appetite in you to go get some for yourself. That's the difference. That is the breakthrough. That is the healing balm. And we don't share this to bring condemnation or weight or pressure. We share this to give you access to take the balm home with you. (laughs) Take it home with you and apply it three times a day to the wound. And watch what this living thing does to the wound. And watch the change take place.